this toasty warm morning in the middle of tick season. So um, before I tell you why we expect Lyme disease in 2012 to be the worst year ever for our risk of exposure, I want to set a little bit of context for the Lyme disease epidemic in the United States. And that is a global context. Next slide, Ira. And that is that whether we like it or not, in fact, we don't like it at all, but we live in the age of emerging infectious diseases. And what that means is that um, there are more and more infectious diseases of humans that are emerging. They're popping up. They're either brand new to science or they're newly discovered by scientists all over the world. So a recent study tallied the number of emerging infectious diseases, new or new diseases of us, that have occurred somewhere on the planet since 1940. And they came up with an astonishing total, 335 emerging infectious diseases just in the past several decades. And what the slide, the map shows is that these are not some infectious disease that occurs far off in the Amazon basin or the jungles of Central Africa. These occur predominantly in the temperate zone of eastern North America, right where we live, and in the temperate zone of West Africa. Next slide, please. Emerging infectious diseases are fundamentally an ecological problem. And the main reason why I say this is that three quarters of these EIDs are zoonotic, which simply means that the pathogen that makes us ill replicates within and is transmitted from some non-human animal to us. Typically, mammals or birds are the non-human animal within which the pathogen replicates. These are not things that we transmit between us that are solely uh, specialized on human beings. These are diseases that come from nature. Next slide, please. So Lyme disease is one of these emerging infectious diseases. And this slide shows several patients showing their characteristic early symptom, the bullseye rash or erythema migrans. We'll hear more a little bit later from Andrew and from Jill about other symptoms, so I won't belabor Lyme disease symptoms right here. Um, but this is one of the characteristic early symptoms. And I know this is a small group. Please uh, go back, please. Uh, this is a small group and a non-random sample. Um, but I'm, I'd be curious to know out of this group, how many people have had Lyme disease or have had a member of the household? who has had Lyme disease. About nine-tenths of the people in this room have had Lyme or a family member or a household member with Lyme disease. OK, next slide, please. So Lyme disease was first discovered in the mid-1970s in Lyme, Connecticut, hence its name. And in 1982, it became a notifiable disease through the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. And what that means is that uh, local and state health departments were then required to report all cases of Lyme disease to the federal government in, in, the, in the form of the CDC. The slide demonstrates this dramatic growth in the number of Lyme disease cases. From a few hundred per year reported cases of Lyme in the early 1980s to a few tens of thousands of cases reported to the CDC um, in the last several, several years. This is known to be an underrepresentation of the true number of Lyme disease cases, although we don't have a good statistic about just to what degree this underrepresents the true number of cases. You often see that the reported cases are more or less 10% of the actual number of cases. We don't know how accurate that is, but somewhere in the ballpark of potentially 300,000 rather than 30,000 cases occur per year somewhere in the United States. That makes Lyme disease even just taking these data at face value, Lyme disease is by far the most frequently reported vector-borne disease in the United States. The same is true in Europe. And in the northeastern U.S., Lyme disease is the number two of all the notifiable diseases that are reported to the CDC, all the dozens of notifiable diseases um, behind only chlamydia, which is a sexually transmitted disease who suffers number in the millions. And I think we'll forego the show of hands about that. <laughs> okay, the next slide. So Lyme disease occurs in two major areas in the United States. One of them is the upper Midwest, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And the other is here, in the eastern seaboard between northern Virginia and Maine. And so this 
This slide shows uh, individual cases of Lyme disease in various counties in the country, and the darkest of the dark, the epicenter, as Donna mentioned, is here in southeastern New York. So the Hudson Valley is right smack dab in the middle of the worst part of this problem nationally. Next slide, please. So Lyme disease is really a very vexing problem in the 21st century, and it is a vexing problem for several reasons. As I just showed you, the number of cases are rapidly increasing, and they're spreading spatially as well. There are no vaccines available to help protect us against this disease, and none on the immediate horizon, so far as I know. Diagnosis and treatment are really quite problematic, and again, we'll hear more about that from the other speakers, but we're not very good at either diagnosing or treating this disease. And we really don't know very well how to manage tick populations to reduce our risk of exposure to this disease. We don't do a very good job of tick management. Next slide, or next. So really, what all we have at this juncture is prevention, personal protection, various ways of preventing um, tick bites, avoiding tick bites. And I would argue that that absolutely requires knowledge of local risk. Where and when are we most likely to confront a tick that might make us sick? And that knowledge, I would argue, comes from ecological understanding. And this is fundamentally one of the principal reasons why I do the research that I do. And hopefully uh, you will agree that ecological understanding can help in our, the only game in town, which is avoidance of this disease. Next slide. So Lyme disease is caused by this creature right here. It's a spirochete bacterium, Borrelia burgdorferi. And that spirochete gets transmitted among wildlife hosts, like this mouse, and from wildlife to humans by the bite of a black-legged tick, formerly called the deer tick. And so here what I'm showing are the three biting stages in the life cycle of the black-legged tick. This guy here is the larva. That's the stage that hatches out of eggs. This is the nymph, and this is the adult, with a couple of specks of dirt for scale. So each of these life stages takes a single blood meal from some vertebrate host, a mammal or a bird, including us, before then, then that, that blood meal takes about three or four days to a week. The tick then drops off the host, and then it molts into the next stage and seeks another host at that stage. So the larval tick takes its single blood meal, one meal, lasts three or four days, drops off the host, molts into a nymph. That nymph then becomes active later on, takes a single blood meal again, three to five days, drops off the host, molts into an adult. The adult takes a blood meal, lasts about a week before dropping off, reproducing, and dying. It turns out that these guys right here, these larval ticks, hatch out of eggs free of infection with Lyme disease spirochetes. Mother ticks don't pass on any infection that they have to their babies. So larval ticks are harmless. And, and they, we probably get bitten by larval ticks all the time without even knowing it. They're so tiny, we probably get bitten without ever detecting them. But there are no bad health consequences of those larval bites because they are not transmitting, they're not infected, and therefore can't transmit a pathogen to us. These larval ticks, though, it turns out, are extremely generalized in their choice of host. They're not picky. They'll feed on almost anything with fur or feathers that happens to come by close enough for them to grab a hold and, and hang on for dear life. If that larval tick happens to feed on an infected host, then it can acquire Lyme disease spirochetes from that host, in which case it molts into an infected nymph capable of transmitting the disease when it takes its next blood meal. And it turns out, in the Lyme disease epidemic all across the country and elsewhere, the, the, it is the nymphs that are responsible for the vast majority of Lyme disease cases. And that's because they're very tiny, as you can see here, if you've ever experienced them in the flesh. They are very small, very hard to see or feel when they're crawling on your skin, or even embedded in your skin, and sucking your blood. Uh, and they tend to be active right around this time of year, May through July is their activity peak. And that's when we are most active out of doors, with the exception of days like today, when you'd have to be crazy to be active out of doors. Except in the morning, 5.30 in the morning. Okay, so nymphs are the main culprit in the, in the Lyme disease epidemic. Next slide. Uh, 
So this is how this life cycle plays out over in the course of two years, because these ticks live a long time for such a tiny organism. So here what we have are eggs hatching out in the mid to late summer, usually about mid-August around here, is when these larval ticks emerge by the thousands. They then take their blood meal from some mammal or bird host, drop off that host after a few days, and then they molt into a nymph, but they spend almost an entire year underground, under the leaf litter, on the forest floor, in a quiescent state, doing nothing. They then emerge as a hungry nymph almost a year later, again, in May through July, seeking a host, which could be you or me, or our pets, or our children, or someone else that we care about. <clears throat> they then take their single blood meal, drop off, molt into an adult, which remains quiescent under the leaf litter for a couple months before then emerging in about November of that same year. Okay? So when it comes to our risk of exposure to Lyme disease, what we're really worried about are how many nymphs there are crawling around on the forest floor. So how high is this peak? How many nymphal ticks are there in the environment? And how many of them are infected with Lyme disease spirochetes? Because not all of them are. So those are the two main risk factors in the ecology and epidemiology of Lyme disease. So what we've done is ask the question, which of the animal hosts out there in the, in the environment are most important in converting these harmless larval ticks into the potentially dangerous nymph stage? And which hosts out in the environment are most important in producing infected nymphs that are the ones that are harmful to us? Next slide, please. So, I'm going to show you data that address these two questions from our lab. So the first question, again, is which hosts are best at converting those harmless tick larvae into potentially dangerous nymphs? And what I'm doing in this slide, please go back, is spilling the beans. Here's the culprit, right here. It's the white-footed mouse. And let me, let me show you the data, how we know this. What we do, next slide please, is we go out in August, okay, August, as you remember, is the larval tick season. That's when they're most active. We go out in August and we live trap and retrieve to the lab members of several different species of hosts, trying to get a lot of coverage in body size and different types of groups, taxonomic groups. So what we do is we go out and we field capture gray squirrels, eastern chipmunks, gray catbirds, white-footed mice, opossums, and veers. We then hold them in the lab for about three or four days until they're tick free. So all their naturally occurring larval ticks have dropped off. They've finished feeding, they drop off, and now the animal is clean, it's tick free. We then inoculate each of those host animals with 100 larval ticks that we've collected locally, which may sound like uh, a gross out, it may sound like we're torturing these poor animals, but 100 ticks is nothing to what, compared to what they experience in real life. They scoff at 100 ticks. Okay. What we then do, we're holding them in wire mesh cages over pans, wire mesh floor to these cages as well, so we can uh, document the fate of each and every one of those 100 larval ticks. And there are two main categories of fate. These ticks can either feed successfully on the host, they blow up with host blood, drop off the host in an engorged state, and we find them in the pan underneath, amongst lots of other stuff. Pan underneath, it's a messy job. Or, these ticks can die in the process of trying. And they die because some hosts groom them off and kill them in the process. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the data. Which of these hosts are best at supporting feeding by these larval ticks, survival of these larval ticks? Next slide. And the answer is, it's the white-footed mouse, predominantly, that is the best at supporting tick feeding. So what this, this graph tells us is that 50% of those 100 larval ticks that we put on a mouse successfully feed to repletion and drop off as an engorged larva, ready to then molt into the dangerous stage. For the two birds and the two other rodents, the values are between about 20 and 25 percent. So they are a poorer host. But then at the other extreme, we have the opossum. And in the case of the opossum, only 3.5 percent of those ticks that we put on opossums successfully uh, survived that experience, with 96.5% being killed by the opossum during the course of blooming. So folks, opossums are our friends. around on the forest floor, hoovering up ticks and killing them by the scores.
So I should have a bumper sticker that says, I break for a possum. <laughs> but I haven't made that yet. OK, next slide. <coughs> so then the next question is, given that we know which hosts are best at supporting larval tick survival to the nymphal stage, which hosts are best at infecting these ticks with Lyme bacteria? So here what we do is we go out and we catch those six species plus a whole lot more. We bring them into the lab in the same way, hold them over wire mesh cages with wire mesh floors, collect all the ticks that drop off them. These are naturally occurring ticks. We then allow the ticks to molt and we subject them to a molecular diagnostic technique to ask how many of those ticks that came off each host are infected with the Lyme disease spirochete. And the data are in the next slide. And again, it's the white-footed mouse that is the major culprit. So what we find is that 92% of the larval ticks that feed on a wild, free-ranging, white-footed mouse uh, acquire an infection with Lyme spirochetes and multi-human infected men. Again, there are a couple other small mammal hosts like the chipmunk and two species of shrews that are decent reservoirs. They, they infect a fair proportion of the ticks, 40 to 55 percent. But most of these hosts are really terrible reservoirs. So for instance, skunks, opossums, raccoons, deer, they're infecting a very tiny proportion down in the low single digits of the larval ticks that feed on them. Next slide. So the bottom line from these two sets of data, one slide from studies that took years, I might add, it's, it is the case that white-footed mice are the main culprit in producing the dangerous infected nymphs that can make us sick. But it turns out, next slide, that white-footed mice fluctuate in numbers from year to year enormously. So these, this slide shows a population dynamics, a trace of the population size of white-footed mice on two of our long-term monitoring plots in Millbrook, at the, on the grounds of the Cary Institute over a 21-year period. We've been monitoring them for a very long time, and I'll show you why this is important in just a second. And these things bounce around hugely. They're not like a normal population of animals that stays fairly constant from year to year. So for instance, if we look right here at the end of 2004, 2005, we had only a handful, two or three individual mice in a four-acre plot of forest in Millbrook. But they don't stay low for very long. What goes down must come up, I guess is the saying, or my butchering of the saying. So in one year, they came up to about 100 individuals per four acre plot. And then the year after that, they bounced all the way up to over 200 individuals per four acre plot. So these guys can go up rapidly, and they can go down rapidly. Well, we have determined over the course of this long-term monitoring what it is that causes mice to go through their ups and downs. And that's in the next slide. And the basic single answer is acorns. So our oak trees produce variable crops of acorns. And I'll show you that in a minute. They're the dominant tree in our forests here in most of the Northeast, in the Appalachian Range, down in the Mid-Atlantic, and the like. These acorns <coughs> are a highly nutritious food source for a bunch of different mice. There's a lot of protein and lipid in these things. They have a long shelf life. So the mice go out and they gather them and they store them in caches for the winter. And when there are a lot of acorns available, mice survive the winter really well. And they even breed in winters when there are a lot of acorns available, which they never do when there are no acorns available. So they've got a jump start on the breeding season, and in the summer following a good acorn year, they reach a peak in numbers. Okay. Next slide. And so what we find is that the number of acorns produced by our friendly neighborhood oak trees is an excellent predictor of how many mice there will be in the next year. So here we see a strong positive correlation between the abundance of acorns, acorns per square meter last year, that's what your T minus 1 is, and the number of mice on one of these grids in year T, that's this year. So we know how many mice there are going to be the previous fall based on acorn production. Next slide. Well, we also know, based on the data that I showed you a few slides ago, these mice are the most permissive host for tick feeding, right? So what we found is that the more mice there are on a grid in year T minus 1 last year, the more dangerous nymphs there will be on that plot this year. Strong, positive correlation between mouse abundance the prior year 
and tick abundance, nymphal tick abundance, this year. So, we ask the question, if nymph abundance is predictable on the basis of last year's mice, and mouse abundance is predictable based on the previous year's acorns, can we predict how many nymphs there are going to be crawling around on the forest floor, potentially making us sick with Lyme disease, based on acorn production two years earlier? And the next slide shows you that the answer is yes, we can. We have seen over the past almost 20 years a strong positive correlation between acorn production in year T minus 2, that's two years ago, and the number of nymphs per 100 square meters this year. So it turns out, as I mentioned earlier, that acorn production bounces around a lot from year to year as well. There are some years, like here, here, and here, where acorn production was basically zero, or virtually zero. The, acorn, the, the oak trees produced few, if any, acorns at all. But some other years, we might see 30, 20, something like that. Well, it turns out that in 2010, we saw an unprecedented phenomenon, which was acorn production way up at 56.5 acorns per square meter of forest floor, as you average it throughout the forest. That was an unprecedented number based on about 20 years of monitoring. What that meant was, based on our previous long-term monitoring and the trends that we had seen, acorns per square meter in 2010 were out here, 56.5. What that suggested to us, if that trend were to continue, and again, this is like with mutual funds, past performance is not a good predictor of of future performance might not be, but in this case we expect that it should be. If this trend continues, we should see 30 nymphs per 100 square meters in the summer of 2012, i.e. right now. And that would be 50% higher than the highest year we had ever seen in 20 years of monitoring. So we expected Lyme disease risk this summer to be quite a lot higher than it's ever been before. That alarmed us. And so what we did, next slide, is we prepared a press release. We wanted to warn the public, warn healthcare providers that we had this expectation of particularly high Lyme disease risk. Lori Quillen uh, from our communications office at the Cary Institute prepared this press release and she did such a good job explaining the complex ecology of Lyme disease in about a page that we got really quite substantial press coverage from this release. Next slide. So this is just a, a partial list of the various news media that covered, uh, covered the story in various ways. And between Men's Journal, Martha Stewart, and Parents Magazine, we were gratified that we covered all the demographics that we possibly could. It's our hope that despite the fact that Lyme disease risk is very high this summer, that that will not translate into a 50% higher number of cases of Lyme disease simply because the word got out and people will be taking precautions that they might not otherwise take if this were just a normal ho-hum Lyme disease year. So let me just wrap up and then I'll turn, uh, turn things over to Andrew. Most emerging infectious diseases come from nature. They don't necessarily come from each other. They come from nature. And in the vast majority of cases, we have no vaccine. We don't even have a cure. In some cases, we don't even have a reasonable treatment for many of these emerging infectious diseases. Because of that, forewarned is forearmed. Our best bet in avoiding these diseases is to know what, what causes risk to be elevated and to take personal steps to avoid exposure. Next, please. In the case of Lyme, by boosting mice, acorn massing, this fluctuating production of acorns, is a leading indicator of Lyme disease risk. And the only way we determine this is by conducting long-term studies. And those have been supported by the federal government through the National Science Foundation, the NIH, and most importantly, through Dutchess County. The taxpayers of Dutchess County uh, and, and the county government has decided to allocate some funding to this long -term and various other efforts that we've made down through the years. And I would argue that because this early warning system can really help us protect health in a major way, that ecology should be considered science. And then with that, I will simply close.
We acknowledge three people who have been instrumental down through the years in, in doing this science and in making the science known to others. And with that, I will stop, and I guess we're waiting for questions.